All right, where do we start? Hello, everyone. Um, please stand up, seriously. <laughs> Everybody up. Um, yeah, we'll begin like this. Okay, so one hand up in there like this. Doesn't matter which hand, just a hand. If you don't have a hand, I apologize for being so. I'm just gonna do like this. Yeah, there we go. In unison, though, like, follow me, like, poof, 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 poof. Great, great, great. Okay, we got that. Keep the hand up. Same hand. It's the next one. Going left to right. In unison again. Yeah. Let's get some. One, boo, ba, boo, e, art, sin. Yeah. And then the next one, put the other hand in the air like this. Face the palms inward like this. Relax, relax your shoulders. All right, we go. One, two, wait, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, lovely, 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 lovely. As an audience in a hip hop crowd, that's all you need to do. <laughs> we call the first one the big ba ba. It's like ba ba. Second one called zero to 100. You might notice this, throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. That's that one. And this one, we, we don't know what this is called. It's just the claps. It's the claps. So kinetic movement. One of our grandmasters of hip hop, of rap music. You can sit down. <laughs> Apologize. Apologize for, for that part. One of our grandmasters of hip hop uh, by the name of KRS One from the Bronx. Um, he gave a definition of hip hop. Hip hop's definition has changed throughout the years. Uh, I think he gave the most definitive um, definition of, and it's the definition that I use when I perform. Um, and he says, hip hop is a mixture of knowledge and movement. So intellect and the kinetic blended together to create these things. Um, and what these things are, hopefully we'll get to, to this. So before we get into Salsa, Society of Spoken Art, t-shirt. A um, little bit about me, to expand on what uh, Cosman, uh, the introduction that he gave. Uh, I started rapping, actually in duress, in protest, actually. Um, I wanted to play jazz. I saw the Benny Goodman story, played the clarinet, I wanted to be a jazz musician. Um, this was when I was maybe eighth grade, I don't know what it correlates to here in, in, uh, in Hong Kong in terms of school systems. Um, but I wanted to play jazz. When I got to high school, I said, okay, I'm gonna go to the band, and I'm gonna go to the band director, and I'm gonna say, hey, can you teach me how to play the clarinet? Um, and he said, no. If you wanted to learn how to play the clarinet, you had to go when you were in grade school and ask them to teach you. Here, we only take people who already know how to play. Um, and I was heartbroken, I was destroyed. And I was like, ah, what can I do? I still want to express myself, I still want to be creative. I still want to put interesting concepts and things together. And I still want to be cool and get the girls and make a lot of money. Um, I was like, rap, you could be a rapper. And I was like, ah, oh, because you, you could teach yourself how to rap. All you need to do is just get some beats and get some words and then just put those beats and words together and then you can become a rapper. And so that was my education. Um, and I threw everything else away. I threw away college. I didn't take any of my college exams or the preparatory exams to get into college. Um, banished any hopes of having any type of career. Uh, crippled myself socially so I wouldn't fit in any organization um, in any capacity. Um, and basically burned the bridges, burned the boats, and threw myself fully into rap. And a, a few of my friends joined with me, and we made the pledge that we were either going to be rappers or we were going to work at the post office. And we came very close to the post office. Luckily, around time, maybe a senior, junior in high school, um, we started to record. I built a studio in my basement. Um, and we were recording little actual mixtapes on tape. And one of my friends remarked, he said, you know, you really sound like you can do this for real. Like, you really sound like, it, is, it doesn't sound like an amateur hour, it doesn't sound like you're trying, it sounds like you can really do this. Um, and 
It's like, okay, so I guess, all right. The next story is all luck. One day in my home studio with my father, he bangs on the floor. He says, hey, uh, Wasalu at that time, it wasn't Lupe Fiasco yet. He says, hey, I want you to go uh, to the west, side of the, t the west side of Chicago, pick up your little sister and bring her back home. And I was like, all right. So you get on a, a bus, take that bus to the train, take that train to another bus. But then you got a choice when you get off that second train where you can either get on the train or another bus. I decided to get on a bus. Uh, all this is going to make sense very shortly. And because I got on a bus, uh, which lets you off in the front of my mother's house as opposed to the train, which will let you off in the back. I happen to be on the front street. Walking down that street, a car pulls up full of guys who I met prior who are either record producers or rappers, and they say, hey, you rap, right? I said, yes, I rap. They said, we're going to this, this showcase uh, for at with Aftermath Records, which you may know from Eminem and Dr. Dre. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm all in, right? Forgot about my sister, that went out the window. Uh, <laughs> jumped in this car of semi-strangers, went to this studio I'd never been, been to before, and lo and behold, there was a representative from Aftermath Records, uh, another person who, who would go on to be my business partner, my manager until this day, um, and a bunch of other rappers, and we just started to rap around this table in this nondescript conference room and got a record deal. And it was really that bit of luck. If I was if I took the train, I would have been on the back street. I would, they would have passed. I would have never seen them. You know, I would be working at the post office. Um, and from there, my career starts. I'm in high school with a record deal. Shenanigans, more shenanigans, dot, dot, dot. Uh, get my first solo record deal. And that first deal was with a group. Get my first solo record deal in maybe 2004 with Atlantic Records. Um, first one goes very smooth. We get four Grammy nominations, win a Grammy. Second one goes very smooth. Uh, we get another set of Grammy nominations. Um, it becomes this cult kind of classic album. It's called The Cool. Uh, third album comes around. Ah, things don't go so well. Things don't go so well. Things do not go well at all. Uh, turmoil with the label. The classic artist becoming, learning himself. The label seeing that the artist has a certain level of, of visibility above and beyond what the label can control. The label wants to control that. The artist resists. The label starts to pull the resources from the artist. The artist is kind of like left to his own devices. Luckily, his fan base that he's developed uh, is ravenous and sort of a little maniac group. They decide to stage a protest in front of the label to get said resources released and release dates and things that thing brought to bear. Uh, they do. It happens. Because of that, you become this uh, figure of sorts. Uh, the label hates you now, so now you're an enemy of the state. Uh, you put out this album. It's your most successful album, second most successful album. Uh, but you know, the, the label hates you, the fans love you, et cetera. That hate relationship at the label just deepens and gets worse. Um, and around those times, I start to have these thoughts. I say, what, who can I reach out to to help with this situation? Who would care? Um, reach out to a lawyer. The lawyer's best interest is lawyering. Uh, there is no real place or situation where artists can, be, can commune uh, and have real dialogue about circumstances without it being solely about the arts, which wasn't the case for me um, and for other artists. It's not about you're not making good enough songs. It's other more structural issues that need to be addressed. Uh, there's no place f really for family to come in and intervene. There's no place for interventions, so to speak. So I was like, man, I wish we had something like that. I wish we had a union so we could bargain Collectively, ha ha, Bauhaus. See, I snuck Bauhaus in there and collectors. <laughs> um, but I wish we had that. Those thoughts kind of sit, they germinate over time and start to think, what does that look like? And start to brush up against, start to sit back and have, ask myself serious questions about formulating something like that and building something like that. And what's the best way to do it, best way to go? The legal business angle 
kind of fell on his face because there were so many different ways that people express the best way to do business. A lawyer has one way, a manager may have another way, an artist may have his or her own way about doing things. Um, and it's just too much noise to try and build something based on business or negotiating contracts or anything like that. Um, and it, you, it, it's a lot of money in that and you know, most artists are broke, unfortunately, so we, we kind of lose most of our court cases. So we said, okay, business is not the place to build it on. Then it went to what about just the music, uh, the love of the craft. Um, and it was kind of, that's too, again, it's, it, it has, too, it's too amoebas, right? There's not enough structure to that, it's too subjective. Um, what I think about your song versus what you think about my song at the end of the day, uh, that's the end of it. It really has no objective uh, meat or weight to it. So then it became, okay, well, not business, not just for the love of the craft, because we already have that, that's not working. What if we built it upon something else? What's missing? What is missing? And so we get to Sosa, Society of Spoken Art. Slide two. Aristotle said that the greatest, allegedly, allegedly there's an Aristotle, and allegedly, that allegedness said this allegedly. The greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor. You sit back and you look and say, well, what do we do as rappers? I say, ah, we're masters of metaphor. Even the most basic rapper, the wackest, as we call it, uh, the most garbage rapper, uh, is still a master of metaphor in some capacity. Engaging with it, building them, blending them, breaking them apart, twisting them, attacking them, defending them. So hey, there's something to that. Hold that in your mind. Remember I said we were trying to figure out what to build it upon. And so we got to sit back and ask questions, well, what is the state of the art? And you say, rappers know how to do it, but they don't know what they are doing. That what is important, that unknown is important, and that it is important. What is the it? It is rapping. Uh, what is the what? And that's where things get interesting. The other piece is rap is mostly learned and refined in the wild. There is no real structure or structural education in rap. There's, there's pieces and there's people that attempt to do it who turn out not to be rappers. Um, and so they mostly deal in the contextual things, not necessarily the content aspects of it and definitely not the structural things of it. They deal mostly in what the raps are talking about. Right? And it says rap is mostly engaged as a commercial exercise, commercial exploit. You talk to any rapper, most rappers, most of them, uh, they want to make money off what they do. Right? They want some type of capitalization moment in what they do, no matter how small or how big, that's what they want. It's how can I put out this mixtape? What's the best way to do this song? What's the best way to do that? And that commercial exercise, commercial exploitation part may seem very subtle, but it is, it is very, very active. And all the way down to the length of a song as we know it is a commercial exercise, right? Having a chorus in a song is a commercial exercise. It's an example of corporate exploitation, right? We just take it for granted because we don't have a structure to analyze it properly and dive deep. So that was the state of the art, still is the state of the art, and will still be the state of the art. Yeah? How do we address that? I think, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a, is there a slide missing? Maybe? Yes, there's, there's a slide missing, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll do it, I'll just do it like this. So rap, the other question which should have been here is rap. What is rap? Anybody know what that is? You, sir. What is rap? Yeah. See, there we go. What about you, what's rap? We're waiting. <laughs> Destroy us with your intellect. 
Ah. Ah, here we go. Rhythm. Okay. What about, what about you in the back? With the with the fan in, with the fan and the flower, the beautiful, lovely flower. What is rap? Take a shot at it. What is rap? Poetry. Oh, I guess good. We're starting somewhere. Okay. So when you sit back and you think about it, you say, well, what is rap? Literally, that what again? Coming back to that what? What are we doing? What's that unknown? You said, well, rap is rhetorical. It's anthropological. It's philosophical. And it's a structure. All taking place in the cognition, in the cognitive space. So raps are rhetorical, anthropological, philosophical structures. So now being a rapper, what are you doing? I say, oh, well, I guess I'm being rhetorical anthropologically using these philosophical structures with my cognition. And they'll say, oh, oh, oh. You've just had your rapper mind expanded. <laughs> Emoji with the head blown up, that one, right? Expanding the rapper mind. First, we identify that there's a rapper mind. Yeah? You have a rapper mind, rapper. And it's not just to entertain. It's not just rhythm. It's not just poetry. There's other pieces and parts that are connected to it that you activate every time you put together a metaphor, every time you spit a verse, as we say, the language that we use. But it's not just entertainment. It's not just for commercial exploits. Something deeper, something more powerful. Something, there's a mastery of something happening that Aristotle said, allegedly. So Sosa, what, what, it isn't business. It isn't, it isn't just for entertainment. It, it's not about just the love of music. It became an educational guild that seeks to introduce formally introduce rappers to the fields of linguistics, semiotics, classical, contemporary, and computational communication, poetic theory and application, literary analysis and criticism, cognitive science, and rap history, theory, and application. Wow, that's a lot. Hold on. <laughs> Let's pause on that to reflect for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, formally first. I've I, I seen uh, Cosman in the on the way to the restroom, I said, man, I feel bad because I'm, I'm one of the only ones uh, that, that's, that's, form, that's talking about formality, right? But the, the other two, my brothers and sister speakers, were like, yo, anarchy! And I was like, no, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we need to know, and to do that, we need a formal system. Um, we need some accountability, we need responsibility, we need to have metrics. We need to be able to sit in a studio and talk about things that won't change tomorrow. Right? Because that level of chaos was just anarchy is way too much because rappers are being abused, artists are being abused, um, and because we don't, we, we don't have a place to really understand the power of what we're doing, we don't have that power. We don't even have soft power. Right? Even arts is a soft power, but since we can't even recognize it, we don't even have that power. We're just replaced and used and thrown away and used and thrown away and at the mercy of donors and patrons and other things. It's like, man, that's cool up to a certain extent. Eventually you want some type of agency of your own. Where was I? So the formal part, it's a formal education. Formal education, I'll get into more on that in the next slide. But why linguistics? Why sem semiotics, communication theory, the study of signs and symbols? How many rappers know about Saucier and the process of signification? They don't. I know, because I didn't, right? Um, and none of my friends did either. And none of my rapper friends knew. And we didn't know what semiotics was. And we didn't know how important it was to what we do. Uh, why go through, why go all the way back to study uh, and read poetics, the classical poetics? Uh, why study George Lakoff and contemporary metaphor theory? Why? Uh, why teach rappers how to code? Why introduce rappers to coding in the coding space? Why well, is that important? Because 99% of what we do in the modern space with rap is expressed in some way or built with a computer. And most rappers do not know how to use a computer, let alone how to code a program within a computer.
but everything you do is invested into a computer and built into a computer. You should be at least aware of what that looks like, what code looks like, what Python looks like, what DOS looks like, C++, Java. We need to know what that looks like, even if we don't know how to use it. We need to be aware of what that is. Poetic theory and application, literary analysis and criticism, what, who determines what is good and what's bad? And what are they using as their reference points and their basis to tell you that your rap sucks or that your album is trash and give you two stars? Or, or if Pitchfork, the worst publication in the world, likes to, I don't like them, uh, <laughs> gives you a four when the album should really be like an eight, a solid eight, they give you a solid six and a half. And say, what is your basis for that? Can you challenge them, right? Can you, can you really speak to and, and stand on that what you were expressing was some type of objection to Russian formalism with your album. And there's seams of that in the album. But it's just, once you get past the ass shaking, it's right there. Right? That's my objection to Russian formalism. But if you don't know that that school exists, you can't really challenge them on that. Should you be challenging them at all? It's a different discussion. But if you do, challenge them deeply. Challenge them to the point of no return. Right? Educate them on what it means to criticize and how to criticize. And not just criticize, but to be critical, which is different than criticizing something. Can you analyze a text? Are they really analyzing your text properly? Right? Using the proper literary devices and examining things in a real, real concise, objective way? Right? Or are they just whimming it and going off what they feel, which is fine if you can justify it? You should be able to justify your feelings. Why? Because you should be able to. Simple as that. Cognition, cognitive science, why do we do that? Because our brains are what we are, and we don't understand how they work. And we should try. And maybe if we do that, we can make better raps. For us, as rappers, that's the way we look at it. If I can teach you how the brain works or introduce you how the brain works, at least functionally and structurally, um, if not totally the way consciousness is built, but at least give you an idea or, or present to you that people don't, the way you think about the brain is not the way your brain works. That's just something that your mind invented to help you kind of think about how your brain works, but that's wrong too. You need something different. You need to be able to, be able to look at an EKG and understand what that means as a rapper. As a, as a rapper, as a person who communicates, you should know how these words and these phrases are built and expressed through your cognition. Rap study, rap history, theory, and application. Uh, most rappers, because they learn in the wild, they learn through their biases. I, and I say, when I say rapper, I mean me. So you can replace Lupe with rapper. You learn through your biases. If you don't want to listen to rappers from the South because you're from New York, you're just going to listen to rappers from New York. You're going to miss all of that beautiful reference, pool of references and slang and opportunities for creating things with southern twang and southern drawl because you're biasing, right? So what we do, we, did, we built a curriculum that was introduce a rapper who might, at, through his, his or her career, listen to maybe, seriously listen to maybe five or six rappers. When I say seriously, they're actually listening to them to learn how to rap better. What if I introduce you to 50 or 100 rappers, the best in their fields, with no bias, no prejudice of where they're from? Ethiopia to Tokyo to Atlanta to LA. And talking about everything, talking about murder, violence, cognitive science. What does that do for you when you're introduced to that? And not only do you have to learn it, not only are you aware of it, become aware of it, you have to mimic what they do. You have to do what they do. And that starts from 1979, the first commercially released rap records, all the way up to now. So you're this backpack rapper who's all about overthrow the government and you don't like the man, um, but can you get the party started? <laughs> right? Well, you can't, Sugar Hill Gang for you, sir. Um, so that's what Sosa is in a, in a big ass nutshell, right? A coconut shell. <laughs> so technically, how do we do this? How do we do all of that, right? 
Uh, it's a guild. Ta -da! That's our first apprentice class right there. They call, they call themselves Lux Primus. We have a thing with Latin for some reason. <laughs> That's our first class. Uh, if you could see Thinking that picture, she's 12. She's our youngest apprentice, uh, named C Blue IT. She's one of the best rappers I've ever heard. Actually, everybody in that picture are some of the best rappers in the world. Matter of fact, all the founding members of Sosa are literally the best rappers in the world. They might have sold the most records, but some of them sold a shit ton of records. I did okay. Um, but in terms of the craft, they're some of the best, hands down. And so we tried to attract the best. So anyway, we'll get back to that, yeah? Because that, that white guy right there, he's going to be important in the next slot. Um, but the structure of it is it's a guild, similar to kind of guilds of the the old and age, furniture guilds or artistic guilds or, or what have you. Uh, we have apprentices. They apprentice for two years. Most of that curriculum, sorry, most of this happens in the apprentice phase. Uh, we do a journey folk phase, which lasts for eight years. I don't know why I keep doing that, because this is down here. Uh, master is 10 years, and grandmaster is 20 years plus. <coughs> Uh, again, most of the work that we're doing now is pointed at this apprentice class, at our, our apprentice program. There's, that's our first year. We're doing our second year now. Uh, they're, excuse me. This class is in there. They're about to graduate into their journeyman, journey folk phase. Uh, we're doing another class. They're going to go into their second year of their apprenticeship. And then this oct just a couple days ago, we closed our application for our process for our third apprentice class. So we're three apprentice classes deep. Uh, we've been running this program for about five years, four to five years. Uh, the journey folk is, we're still figuring out what that is. <laughs> but it's basically a little bit more the things that they learn in this apprentice aspect, applying it, going out into the world, journeying, as they say. Uh, the master piece is people like me. I'm a master. Um, I'm actually about to turn into my grandmaster thing. I actually have to do my thesis. It's a reconstruction of Akira, uh, the entire film in rap, like a silent film, but replaced with raps. Um, to transition from master to grandmaster, you have to do a project of some ambition, and so that was the one I chose. Um, and the grand masterpiece is people who've, who, are, who have done things in the space, uh, the space of rap that have been pivotal, or have done things like people rap, I wanted to rap like that guy, or that girl, that woman, excuse me. Um, so it's, it's arranged, but that's kind of the structure. IT, we, it's an entrusted network. Uh, everything is done in a, we have a big sense of privacy and trust, so we refer to each other as ITs in trusts, um, that's the structure. And so these people that you see in this picture, uh, how do we get this into them? And then we do that through this. So our curriculum, uh, we, use, we take advantage of something called academics and residence, it's heirs. Um, and the heirs are that white guy. That's Dr. Nick Mumford, uh, IT and IR. He's a uh, computational uh, science, a computer scientist, and a computational poet who teaches at MIT. Um, and he's one of our academics and residents. Uh, funny story about him is he actually w wanted to be a rapper. So he came into Sosa as a rapper in our second year apprentice class. So he's actually an IT and an academic in residence. Um, 
scripture. Actually, and that, the little lovely white lady that's next to him is, um, her name is Shep. Call her the hip hop mom. She's based in Denver. Uh, she was an English teacher for 40 years at Denver Public Schools. Um, and a, is a rapper. She raps. And everyone in the hip hop community loves her. Right? And she's one of our academics in residence. So what is an academic in residence? Academic residents are professors, teachers, writers, thinkers, workers in the field. Um, we are interested in becoming aware of. So if it's cognitive science, we search out cognitive scientists. If it's computers and it's computation, we search out computer scientists. And we actually have more computer scientists as IRs than we have anything else. So working at MIT, uh, working at, where's, where's Jahave? Jahave actually was here at the University of City, the City University of Hong Kong, is that a thing? Uh, here teaching. Um, and our, our rap studies curriculum was built and designed by a brother named Kevin Beecham, who wrote an uh, encyclopedia of hip hop rap releases. So he basically knows every single rap song that's ever been released from 1979 to 1989. And then from 1989 to 1999. And from after that, he gave up because he said it was just too much. Um, <laughs> but every single release. So he can tell you when the first ad lib was done. He can tell you when the first backing vocal was done. He can tell you just all these amazing facts, but he's not a rapper. He just loves the, the thing that we do and put himself to work in, in that capacity. So basically we look for people, again, that are heavyweights in their field. I remember I talked with LL Cool J um, about Sosa, and I remember telling him, like, yeah, you know, we, we're doing this thing, and, uh, you know, we 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 putting together this curriculum in this course, and I had I was like, but, but look, we're getting real professors <laughs> to come in and give us the curriculum, because I don't want people thinking that, yo, we, we some professors now, like, no, 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 no. we're we going to stick to what we do, which is rap, and we're going to go and source the curriculum of the things that we're trying to learn from the actual legitimate sources as high as we can possibly go. Um, and where that takes us is interesting. Sometimes it's to universities, sometimes it's to businesses. So there's a couple IRs that are actually just CEOs of, of companies because um, we're interested in other relationships in the corporate space. Um, and so they help us entrepreneurs. So we have entrepreneurs in residence, so to speak. Uh, where do we get these people from? We have people from MIT, have people from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Denver Public Schools and beyond, Harvard, you know, th throw up. We've been there. Whenever there's something we want to know, we use our rapper abilities and leverage our kind of visibility to get into places where we probably wouldn't be, such as Parasite. Yeah. But we're constantly searching, um, building out this curriculum um, everywhere for relevant Revel, excuse me, relevant material and other airs. So if anybody's interested um, in possibly helping us build this curriculum up, um, we're interested in all the fields that I mentioned, visual arts, architecture, everything. So if, if you, it's as little as suggesting a, a book that we could possibly read um, to your theses or your papers or pointing us in a direction, we're just, we're open. open. To, to any assistance that we can in, in refining and building the curriculum that we have. Um, where does it all take place? We have on, an online MOOC, so just an online kind of message board. Uh, we do a teleconference and lecture every Sunday. Um, and it's normally hosted by, by two or three heirs um, and myself leading a, a lecture in some capacity. Um, and then we do discussions. Um, so it's just a, a continuous uh, full thing. and. Just a, a little bit about the apprentice program. It runs for two years. Uh, there's, you have to apply for it. So every we go through about 100 or 200 um, applications every year. This year we went through 100. Last year we did like 275 or something like that. Um, and we, we get that down to 15. Um, and then we, they run through a two-year intensive program. So every there's no holiday breaks, no Ramadans, no Christmases, no anything. You're on the calls, right? um, really driving it home. Uh, so that's that. What is this stuff? FUV. So these are our guiding principles. Uh, we wanted to make sure that when we set up SOSA that it was built on solid principles. Um, and where do we go for those? 
the world of architecture. One of the first things that you, when you, when you do your application process at Solsa, or to try and come into Solsa, um, you have to read Adolf Luce's Ornament and Crime, um, which is a text uh, that was, he derived it from uh, going to, I think, Chicago and looking at Louis Sullivan's um, architectural work. And Louis Sullivan prided himself on form follows function. Um, and using certain principles, which are classical principles of architecture, which things have to be solid, they have to be useful, and they have to be beautiful. So we take that FUV, fermitas, utilitas, venustas, um, and kind of put that as the, the guiding light for all of our ITs. You know, so if you're, if you're creating something, make sure it has a solid foundation, um, make sure that it is a, has a high level of utility and purpose, that you're not doing things just to do it, and that it's, it's, it's beautiful. But what is beauty? What is it? Uh, for some, beauty is protection. For some, beauty is a shield, because it, distract, it keeps you from being distracted by other beautiful things. Really weird, right? But some, for some people, beauty is amorphous, and it can't be defined. Um, but elegance maybe can. So make it elegant. Make it impressive. Make it jaw-dropping. Make it shocking. Whatever beauty is to you, but make sure that it's fucking in there, OK? Um, so those are kind of the guiding principles, fermitas, utilitas, venustas, and hopefully leading them to unite those and use unitas as, uh, as that. So you hear FUV thrown around a lot. Does your work have FUV in it? We'll ask a lot of ITs that, and they know what that is, like, oh, yes. And they can explain, like, yes, it's solid. It works. If you repeat it, if I say it, it's not just to my tone. So if you repeat the same thing that I wrote, it'll be just as amazing and just as impactful. Um, does it serve a purpose? Is it didactic? Is it instructive? Um, and then, again, is it beautiful? Results. What have we accomplished with all of that up till now? Uh, one of the things is uh, Udapo. I don't know if some of you are familiar with Ulipo. Uh, Ulipo is the workshop of potential literature. It's a French writing group, experimental. Uh, and that spawned a bunch of other groups Udapo Po groups. So we decided to start Udapo, which is all about taking rappers and getting them to do and accomplish amazing, impossible things with rap. Uh, one was writing a rap that you could read uh, in every single direction, whether it was up, down, in verse, in front of you. So it's kind of like a crazy Samoan lap palindrome kind of thing. And it took four of us to do it. Uh, another was Sosa Athletics. What does it look like if rap is not just this entertainment piece, but it becomes a sport? What does that look like? Um, we, we have something called the Barbarian, um, which is basically like CrossFit meets rap. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Uh, <laughs> uh, murder boarding, uh, which is why do battle rappers just have to battle each other? Uh, what if we got battle rappers to battle products? What if we got battle rappers to battle institutions? What if we got battle rappers to battle whatever you like, but actually the best battle rappers in the world? What does their research process look like? How do they de de gather data? What does their, re their rebuttal process look like? Can you formalize that? And can you package that and take it to company X to really think through and solve your problems or your issues, or your community acts. Uh, corporate workshops, uh, we just finished one with IBM, um, which was really successful, which we're really proud about. Um, talking about communication, taking the things that are special about the rapper mind and uh, applying it to corporate problems or social problems. Uh, building a community was another one that we achieved, which is really good. Now there is a place where rappers can go that is their home that isn't worried about how many records you sold, right? Where your work can last for 10 years and somebody's there to get it and understand it. You can make a song that's three hours long and people will listen to it. Radio is not the end point for you. You can publish a paper on it, right? Uh, the Sosa Field Manual, all of this curriculum, all these disparate parts and books and things that we pull in the library that we have, we're squashing it down into one book, which will be available to you hopefully soon, maybe next year we'll be finished with it. But it's taking all the things that we learned and putting it in one place so it's not just scattered all over the place. Uh, 
data-driven arts, right? Art just not based on feel, but actually I want to have the optimal experience and create the optimal verse to solve your problem. What does that look like? I'm tired of shooting in the dark. I want to be able to access data, assess it, process it, and then create from that. So wrapping has a little bit more of a, a drive. And then question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know. But we like that. We don't know what else there is to do. And we're constantly exploring and planning and hoping that we'll uh, crash into those things. And das es fin. It's like three languages to say the end. Thank you.